Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Autogafool. So we are here in Amsterdam with the brand new A-Class. This is the third iteration of this car and Mercedes-Benz describe it as the A-Class all grown up. Well, we're going to take a look tonight, the exterior, the interior, tell you everything that's changed and most importantly, answer the question, is it a worthy addition to the lineup? Let's find out. So let's start down at the nose. Well, as you can see, Mercedes have gone with very much a snub nose design here. You'll see more of that as we see the car in profile, but that makes the car look a lot more aggressive than its predecessors, particularly the first one, but probably the less said about that, the better. The design here, apparently, according to Mercedes, was motivated by a lot of time and miles that they spent in the wind tunnel, making sure the aerodynamics worked for the car. What they really wanted to express more than anything else was that this, their entry-level car, could function as a fully-fledged Mercedes-Benz. And we see this with the design language immediately. Does that look in any way familiar to you? I'm guessing it might do. The CLS is borrowing the same design language as well. Here you can see this star-studded grille and, of course, the full flat Mercedes badge. This, of course, hides all of the sensors beneath. Now, we have adjustable air flaps underneath in the grille, which help control the air intake directly into the engine. That makes the car, of course, more efficient and also maybe a little bit faster. So, looking at the headlights here, we have optional full-spectrum LEDs. Here we have the halogens. But of course, those come with Mercedes-Benz technology to allow you to only focus on the parts of the road that do not have cars coming in your direction. I would say overall, it's a very stylish front. I like the angularity of it, but I understand that's not for everyone. So please tell us what you think in the comments. If you think that this is not the design you would have gone for, we'd really like to hear about it. The bonnet could be said to be a little bit flat, but I do like the smooth way in which the bumper runs straight into it. The bonnet comes with technology that lifts the bonnet up to help if you have an impact with a pedestrian. Of course, that's not unique to Mercedes, but it is nice to see it included on a car of this size and type. Overall, the look from the front is sleek and dynamic. And for an A-Class, I think that's quite impressive. Coming through to the side of the car, the first thing you notice is the length. This is 14 and 41 meters long and 14 foot five in length. So that's significantly longer than its predecessor, 12 centimeters or around about four inches. Now, you can feel that in the styling. I really like this character line here that sweeps right through the side and then flows straight into the wheel arch. Wheels go from 16 to 19 inches maximum, depending on the level that you get. And those really accentuate the way that the car sits on the road. We have a nice high shoulder line here. And one of the things that I really enjoy straight off the bat about the styling of this vehicle is that attention has been paid to the driver's experience of using it. That's why the pillar only takes up 90% of its predecessor, so we have 10% more all-round visibility right around the car. Now, in a minute, we're gonna take a look inside to see how that feels as a driver, but from the exterior, going against the previous iteration of the A-Class, you can see how it impacts on the design. There's a lot more space, a lot more room, and a lot more light, but all that in a sleeker, tighter, more aggressive body. I don't know about you, but I'm really liking the side. Coming around to the back, we see similar styling cues that make this car look sharp. But let's not forget one of the hang-ups of the previous A-Class was load space. Remember that? Well, look at the way that they've now tapered off the rear entrance. We have a much better load space. We are going to be looking inside the car in a little while. But for now, let's just concentrate on the outside. We have nice 
angular rear lights that flow into the rear, a lovely soft flow through from the side to the rear bumper. And I would say that the rear of this car is designed to be inoffensive in every respect. There are some Mercedes, the AMGs in particular, that are designed to look aggressive and really powerful on the road. This one is just nice and discreet. Obviously, lots of us would prefer not to have these fake exhausts that we have here, but they do lend themselves to not interrupting the overall flow of the rear of the car. And I'd have to say, it's really very tasteful. So the car that we're looking at is Iridium Silver, and it really is a very effective color for this car. Also available is Digital White, Sun Yellow, and Denim Blue. But for my taste, I'm all about the silver. It's understated, it's discreet, but it really emphasizes the aggressive styling of the car, if that's how you want to interpret it. So it's not just the wheels that have changed with the A-Class, it's also the suspension. And we have the base, we also have sports, and we also have adaptive. The sports is 15 millimeters lower, and I'm pretty sure you can guess by looking at this which one this is. That's all designed to make the drive a little bit tighter, a little bit tauter, and give you more options as a driver that you can change while you're enjoying the engines. Mercedes are really quite keen that you don't think of this car in one format only and because of that they have different styling trims of course as you would expect and here we can see a slightly more aggressive front. Look at the way in which this design live scoops right round up into the air intakes which are here. Obviously controlling the amount of air that the engine gets making it more efficient but also making it look kind of sexy. Now let's take a look inside the back and see what's changed. Wow. Well, for those of you who are used to the A-Class, this is a significant improvement on boot space. It's actually 29 liters larger than its predecessor. That makes it about 379 liters of load space. And as you can see from here, the significant change is how you can address the boot. This opening right here is 20 centimeters larger, and that makes a huge difference when you're loading it with suitcases. I think that's all to do with the longer wheelbase and also the way that the suspension fits in because we have dropped the height of the vehicle. Really, this now is more than enough space, and if we look at previous A-Class, I think one of the many criticisms of it were that it just didn't have quite enough room in the back. I don't think that's a criticism. You can level at it now. We have a flatbed load space in here. And as you can see, the distance between the back of the trunk and the floor is around about four to five inches. That's much easier of an ingress in order to be able to fit your things in. If we look here underneath, we can see that we have the space for the subwoofer for the sound system and also some extra room for the tools and anything else you could want to pop under there. Really, I think that this is more than enough space for anything that your average A-Class owner could want to fit back there. So now let's take a look at the interior. Okay, so as you can well imagine, there are 300 journalists here and there are two cars. So we had to fight in order to be able to get the interior shots. And that means that we had to take what we were given. So for me, a little disappointing because this is what I would describe as the sports version of the interior but it's gonna give you a good overall picture. Because of that, we have high gloss here on the extractors, and we have a carbon fiber effect on the dash. Not my taste, and personally, not in keeping with the car, but it's nice to be able to see it as an option. Let's talk about the entire experience of the cockpit. Well, the first thing, and most noticeable, are these three independent air conditioning ports. 
and I really like the way that they are stylized to be completely unique. We have a red ring on the interior that kind of makes them look a little bit like an exhaust port from Star Wars. I don't know if that's accidental or intentional, but it looks pretty cool. They are nice to use, nice to touch, and I would hope extremely effective. I am really not convinced about the high black gloss, but again, that's just this model. If you can see, Jonas can scoot in on anywhere on the high gloss, you can see fingerprints are absolutely horrible. So if you're gonna go with the car, do not go with high black gloss, unless you have a little bit of OCD and you love polishing stuff. Okay, enough about that. Let's have a look at the overall driving experience. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is Space. They've completely redesigned the way that the interior functions in order to make you feel that you are truly in a modern car. This large screen is the largest of the ones available. That's 10.25 inches across. There are actually two screens in this display, one of which is just pure display, one of which, as you can see, is touch. Now, that is the top model. You can also get it in two 7-inch screens, or you can get one 7, one 10.25-inch screen, depending on your taste. If you can afford it and you can spring for it, I would absolutely say go for the two 10.25-inches because it really looks great. It has kind of a floating feeling in front of the dashboard, and the information is presented to you really well. We're going to take a little bit more of a detailed look as to how this operation system works. But suffice to say, it's very intuitive, it's very detailed, and you can tailor it exactly to the experience that you want. Now, we are familiar with the steering wheel setup from the S-Class. If you haven't seen that review, go back and have a look. It's really impressive, the amount of technology that they fitted into what they would describe as an entrance-level vehicle. And I think it's worth talking about that, because although we haven't been privy to pricing, tonight one of the common criticisms that mercedes experience for their entrance level vehicles is they are eye-wateringly expensive especially if your taste is like mine and you're going for an a45 now we haven't been lucky enough to see one of those yet but hopefully we will soon but even though the pricing hasn't come out i can tell you that this is going to be significantly more than what you would consider to be an entry-level car or me for that matter too however if you look at what you get for that money, it's really nice to see that Mercedes wants to reward you for your time and money. They have put a lot of time testing into this vehicle. Two winters, two summers, and I think many hundreds of thousands of miles. I forget the figure, possibly 120,000, um, possibly even more. It really is exceptional, the amount of design that they put into this vehicle, and all designed to make you understand the value that you experience when you drive it. Now. Speaking as a person who has done extensive testing with Mercedes, I can tell you that in my experience, they reward you more than almost any other car, and that is a result of the extensive testing. If you are interested in Mercedes, but you're concerned about the price point, I would always say, take it out for a test drive. See how it feels. It's either going to be your style and work for you the way that you want, or it isn't. But that will explain the price to you. Now. Because it's a Mercedes, you find that there are slightly different features than you would expect on other cars. One of which is the haptic feedback on this pad right here. Now, owners of previous Mercedes or fans will be familiar with the jog shuttle wheel that we ordinarily feature here. Here you can see it's been replaced by this. This is a large touchpad. And this is not least to do with the fact that now we have a touchscreen, which has conveniently turned itself off. Let's see if we it back okay it's telling me i don't have a key well that's fair enough um, you have the option to communicate with your car in three ways you can either touch the screen you can talk to the car or you can use one of the direct touch mechanisms that's either the touchpad down here or these two touch pads in the steering wheel again if you're used to the higher class of mercedes you'll know that but what you will not know is the new and revitalized Mercedes-Benz User Experience, or MBUX. That is unique and new for this car. And what that does is it allows you to personalize the intelligent software, which over time learns your unique and specific requirements. 
and that's really a pretty fantastic feature in an entrance level car. All of which is to say, yes, this car is going to come at a premium price tag. There's no doubt about that. But Mercedes want you to know that the money that you spend on this car is going to be paid back to you in terms of features that you do not expect on an entrance level model. Again, the only thing I can say to you is, you need to drive it. Find out if you think it's worth the extra money and then see how you feel. But if my previous experience of driving the A-Class is anything to go with, I think this could be a corker and I can't wait to try it out. One of the most important features about the brand new A-Class is how you can interact with it. This is the first time the MBUX or Mercedes-Benz user experience has been featured on any car. And in time for that, we're very happy to say that Mercedes-Benz have finally decided to allow us use of a touchscreen within one of their cars. So, we've all been waiting for this a very long time. Is it worth the wait? Let's find out. The system's available either with two seven-inch screens or two 10.25 screens, or one seven inch and one 10.25 inch screens. So here, as you can well imagine, we have the top of the line, the two 10.5 inch screens, and you can see the panorama that that represents. Obviously in the car, a little different feel here to the demonstration model, but you still have this notion of a floating display right in front of you as you're driving. So, we think that we know the responsive display already from the S-Class that we were in quite recently, but it's been updated in terms of the interface, and I'm happy to say it's really nice to use. We're familiar with these two touchpads on the steering wheel, and here they are used really nicely in order to be able to access the information. If Jonas zooms in a little bit, you can see a red dot that comes up just there. Can you see that, Jonas? and that will tell us which part of the screen we're interacting with. So right now, I'm over here and I can change what's displayed on the left-hand side. Now, I've used an awful lot of these systems in which managing to select what you want to look at is very cluttered and not intuitive at all. And I'm happy to say that this really does make it easy to get the information you want when you want it and the potential for customizing the screen to give you a thousand different appearances really is vast. Some of the functionality is available in full screen display. So the map, for example, you can have that take up the entire driver's display. Others is not, but really, whatever you could wish to display, this does it. And that's quite a little bit different from previous Mercedes, where we had the choice of going with either a sporty look or a classic look. So personally, I'm very happy to see the evolution here. Now, I don't want to make you wait any longer. The touchscreen. Well, it comes at a price. The price is that we have lost the jog shuttle wheel, and now we have just the touchpad instead. But actually, it's really been integrated nicely. If we have a look down here first at the touchpad, new is haptic feedback that we can now get off the controls here. And the really nice thing about that I'm not sure if you can quite hear that clicking noise, but it's making a clicking noise as I move it. And the nice thing about that is it really allows me to change the display without needing to look at it. Obviously, there's a lot more to be said about that when we come to the voice interaction. But before that, let's have a look at this touchscreen and see how good it is. Well, you would expect, I think, from Mercedes that if they were going to take this long to finally give us a touch in the car, it ought to work well. And I'm happy to say that it does. Let's see if we can get to the map section. So, going back to the map. You have it here. Currently, we're driving, started route guidance and you're free to interact with the map as you like. It's at your fingertips currently. So you can start exploring whatever you want in your surroundings. For example, going closer to certain areas, twisting it. It's now very performant through the use of the new NVIDIA Pocket Chips. So we could also demonstrate 
the interaction touchscreen is possible in the settings of the car. Main settings are given here, but you also have a quick entry using the car, just touching where you want it. So, for example, you have vehicle settings, just go there, or system, or lights. It's just at your fingertips. Here you see, jumping in is as quick and intuitive as you would like it in a car. This being Mercedes-Benz, of course, they haven't just provided us with the technology, they've also provided us with an expert in order to help us understand how it works and make sure that I don't break it. But seriously, I like to sit and play with the electronics in any car that I drive, and I, I honestly can say I don't think I've seen as vast of a range of options that come with this system in terms of making it work exactly the way you want. That's how the whole thing's been set up. And a huge part of that is interacting with the system through voice. This is the first Mercedes-Benz again to feature an intelligent learning system. So although there are a full and comprehensive range of commands you can give to the car right off from day one when you're driving it, you can also teach it to better understand what it is you want and quite what it is you mean when you say various different things. Now, it's a little bit loud here, so it, it doesn't work quite as nicely as you would hope that it would in the car, but to give you an example, let's try out something that I think uh, anybody might want to say. Let's try. And I'm not going to cheat and use your microphone. Ah, I'm going to use the car. Here we go. What are you doing? So there are two ways in which we can activate the voice. We can either just talk to the car, which we would do by saying, hey, Mercedes. Please speak now. It worked. I didn't really want to say anything. Then let's try something. Make my feet warm. Okay, well, this is the first time I've spoken to it. So fair enough, it's not quite up to speed with, with my bizarre voice yet. Surround lighting. Ah, uh, it's sad. <laughs> it's sad. Well, you get the idea. I won't take up acres of time just by explaining to you all of the things that the voice commands can do, but they are comprehensive, and really the most exciting bit of the system is that it's designed to learn as you go. So the longer you own this car, the better your interaction with it will become. And I think you can see that straight away in terms of this. It can be a little overwhelming, to step into a cockpit with quite this many features to start with. But over time and ownership, you really do get the best out of being able to personalize your car. So a quick word about interior storage space. Obviously on a smaller car, it's always something that you're gonna be somewhat concerned with. And here, because of the design of the dash, we've obviously taken quite a large chunk out of potential storage area in exchange for styling. That is to make this display screen appear as if it's hovering forwards of the dash. But we can see we have actually a very generous glove compartment here for everything that you could wish to store. We also have netted storage, and I know that long-term followers of the a Plus will be more than familiar with those. We have very nice mid-console storage. I have absolutely no idea what this lever does. If you know, please tell me in the comments. I would love to know. We have inductive charging here for a phone, two cup holders, and then slightly further back, a really nice size center console storage bin. And particularly nice, we have two charge points up here, and they are both USB-C. So again, if you have a USB-C device, no problems there. You can easily get a converter if you don't and you wanna keep something else in there. So now let's take a look at one of the other interiors that are available. Well, this is a little bit more of me. As you can see, we've got a somewhat more discreet effect than the carbon fiber, but still this high gloss black on the dash and on the control console, which makes for a lot of fingerprints. But it's really very nice in here. These seats come available in three different flavors. You have the base, you have the comfort, and then you have the sport. If you go with the comfort or the sport, you get the ability to extend the leg room that's available. I think that's nice, but not a must have feature. 
Talking about must-have features, let me talk to you a little bit about augmented reality. That sounds like the kind of thing you want to work, right? <laughs> well, here in this car, what that relates to is the display. Basically, that means you can pull up a display from the front camera that shows you what's ahead of you whilst also giving you information about it. We'd love to be able to show you here. We can't, unfortunately. We will do when we do the drive test. But it basically looks like a Google Street View with over the top information about what it is you're looking at. It's really nice if you're in a town you don't know or somewhere that you don't recognize because it gives you all the information you need right there and it's fully updatable as with every other piece of software on the car which means as the information improves so too will the interface so our third layout of the night and here you can see that we have a nice wood detail but i think this is leather and possibly the seats as well but a lot of people like that so if that's your thing you're going to be happy the dashboard is also covered in this and the car looks very stylish now this car has a feature that we haven't seen before on the other cars that we've looked at. This has a heads-up display in this well here. Now, that is going to give you, again, you can change the information that it displays, but it will provide you with the information that you want directly on the road. Now, I don't know if Jonas can capture it from there. If Maybe if he comes in the back, he can see. We have the head-up display activated and you can see the direction, the speed, and also the road conditions ahead. It's really nicely delivered. It's inobtrusive. There's no pop-up glass screen in front of your dash to annoy you. And it just gives you the information that you need. To me, it's a really nice compliment to the already excellent two displays that you have available for the driver. So naturally, with a longer wheelbase and a larger car, what you expect is more room in the rear. Let's find out how the A-Class delivers. Well, okay, time to come clean. I am not a tall person. But I think as you can see, there's not quite as much space back here as I would like. We've got a reasonable amount of leg room, but bear in mind I have very, very short legs. I'm embarrassed to say when I buy jeans, they don't even sell the size that fits my legs. 28 inches if you want to know. If you want to buy me a pair and send them in, I'd be very happy. Anyway, <laughs> let's take a look at this. I am five foot ten or 178 centimeters and I have very short legs and look I don't know if that's going to be a particularly comfortable ride over the long distance and I think that these seats are set reasonably far back I don't think that in any way they're crushed to the back head height well as you can see I do have a long torso but I've got very little headroom back here and I must say I'm a little disappointed I am very comfortable but would I really want to do a long drive in the back of this car? Not particularly, and I am not a tall person. So bear in mind, if you're buying an A-Class, you really want to be thinking in terms of short trips for backseat drivers, not long touring trips. But it's a small car. What do you want? OK, so let's have a look at the interior now that we're inside. Really nice microfiber finish on the door. That really emanates quality. We have a chrome effect door handle and a nice discreet speaker here. Again, another one down here and a reasonably sized door pocket. You're not gonna fit two liter water bottle in there, but you are gonna manage to fit a slightly smaller one. A net behind the seat for you to store things in. Ah, looks a little bit cheap. I think I could have done with something a little bit nicer. I really like these i'm not sure if we can get some light on there jonas is that a little too dark can you see that so i really like these features they're echoes from the front of the car you'll have seen these before they're multi-directional outlets for the ac system but they feel like they're well made, they're soft to the touch in terms of their operation, and they stay where you put them to. In my experience, the outlets for the AC are often where cars let themselves down and save money. It's nice for me to see that in the rear of this car, that is not something that's happened. These feel good, they look good, and they behave well. Coming back down, very happy to see that we have two charging points here. And goodness me, it looks as if they are both USB-C. I have not seen that in a car yet. So quite excited to see it now. 
for those of you who say, well, I don't have USB-C, I've only got micro USB, doesn't matter, you can buy a converter. The nice news is, as you buy a new phone, or dare I say, a laptop, it will work with these. Got a nice storage space, the tunnel doesn't take up too much room, and overall, if the only thing that you're using this for is nipping in and around town as a backseat passenger, you're going to be more than happy. It won't come as a massive surprise to you to learn that the back seats have a 60-40 configuration. You can fold them down as you wish. Obviously, you can fit a lot more in the back if you do. I'm thinking most people owning this car are not gonna spend a huge amount of their time in Ikea, but if they do, you still have the space to store the goods that you bought. Optional is a panoramic roof and I think that's going to do an awful lot in terms of making your rear seat passengers feel like they have a lot more air and room back here. I wouldn't describe it as cramped. I think I would just say it's a little small for a car with this wheelbase. But maybe I'm being a little unfair there. It certainly continues the feeling of quality you have throughout the vehicle and it's more than comfortable enough. Thomas can't be with us today because he's test driving with BMW in Portugal. But don't worry, Thomas, we haven't forgotten about you. I am very pleased to be able to show you this is the lineup of the different seat fabrics that you can have with the new A-Class, and they are all man-made leather. That's right, so no real leather. Great job, Mercedes, nearly. Behind us, we also have the AMG lineup of seat covers there you can get real leather. So not completely, but still, it's very nice to see that you can get so many great options now that don't have to come in leather. So a brief look inside the engine compartment, as is often the problem with premier events, we don't actually know which engine is fitted to this car, which is a bit of a shame, but we can get a sense of the overall layout. Now, Given the amount of space that we have, or rather don't have with this configuration, I'm thinking this is probably the two liter, but I would absolutely love it if any of our viewers want to tell me that I'm horribly wrong and tell me why. I'm always keen to find out where I'm going wrong. This is a really nice compact layout. A lot of attempt has been made to fit this into the snub nose design that works so well in the wind tunnel. What you can see here really is the synthesis of a huge amount of design and exploration in engine technology as it fits into aerodynamic packages. It's a little difficult to get emotional about something with a plastic cover on the top, but honestly, it looks pretty good to me and I just can't wait to try it on the track. We are very lucky to have been joined by Gordon Wagoner, who is the chief designer of the brand new A-Class. Well, first of all, Gordon, can I say congratulations? It's a really lovely design. Thank you, sure you can. I have to be honest with you. Okay, B. The first iteration of the A-Class, not so classy. The second made significant steps. This one looks like a beast. What was the thinking behind the design evolution? Well, um, the big change started with the current model when we changed the architecture to more of a, this hood design. And um, that was really successful and it changed the company actually from a traditional luxury to a modern luxury to a complete new set of buyers and younger customers and so on. We lowered the average customer almost by 20 years. And so now this success story of the most progressive car in the segment, we put into that one here and we optimized it in all ways. First of all with the proportion, the car looks almost like a rear wheel drive car. So the front is very low, uh, very short overhangs, dash to axle is like a rear wheel. And um, it's like the most sportiest uh, balanced proportion you can see in that segment. And the cool thing is that allows us now to take stuff out. We must not throw lines on it anymore. So if we like it, we take a line off. If we still like it, take another line off. And so with that uh, approach, we are looking at a very clean but super sexy car, a very aggressive car. You see the front end is, is very, it's a predator face, that's what we call it, with that sharp um, eye, eyes and our racing grill and so on. So I think uh, we put that expressive idea onto a new level. Now I saw your quote earlier and I very much liked it and identified with it about removing a line where it's not necessary. I see a lot of the CLS in this car. Is, mm -hmm. is that a, a, a fair comment? Um, we put that Predator phase actually on, on both cars, the CLS and the A-Class, because they are both our two most progressive cars, so they both deserve that kind of very inter 
in, in variations the front end. So um, yeah, that's why. And of course the cars are like on the other ends of the spectrum. So I think that works, yeah. So I understand that we have taken 10 years off the average age of the A-Class owner. How? And is that desirable? I think it's even more than that, actually, but I don't have the concrete figure. Uh, but in the US, even with the, with the other derivatives, uh, derivatives like uh, CLA, uh, we are looking at uh, 30 years of age, 80% uh, new buyers. Um, I think that's, that's the story of the A-Class, that finally Mercedes, um, that young people say to their, to their um, parents, hey daddy, please bring me an A-Class home. And they would have never said that before, like two generations before. And I think that is a big achievement, but also because um, every Mercedes in each segment is a luxury pick. So it's a modern luxury. And the A-Class transformed that company from a traditional luxury to a modern luxury brand. And I think this is really what um, also young people are keen on. Um, they want, you know, they want labels, they want a luxury product, and of course they want the hardest and coolest. And that's exactly the core of our philosophy. We call it hard and cool, sensual, pure, emotion and intelligence, and all that is in that new language and in, of course in the interior design and the UX design, yeah. Now what I find most impressive about this car from a design standpoint is that it's a very gutsy, snub-nosed design. And in a, in a world in which a lot of car manufacturers are going safe, they're going for very traditional designs, this one stands out. It has that snub nose that really projects. Yeah. It must have taken a lot of guts to do that with the design. Absolutely, um, but uh, again, this is a big responsibility to design that car. Also, it's a big responsibility, uh, responsibility to design that brand. And, and I think um, as a luxury brand, you have to go in the lead, you have to be brave. Uh, I mean, do we start and say, wake up today and say, let's do something average today, right? No, we don't do that. We say, let's do something extraordinary today. And this is what we try to achieve with this car and all of our cars, and I hope we manage there. Yeah. Well, that's very much what I look for from Mercedes, but I have to ask, favorite design feature is? Typical question, typical answer. The whole car, of course. Oh, it's the composition of everything. So let me just pick a few. The front end, we talked about the Predator face. Look at the lamps and this aggressive face. It's very progressive. The whole proportion is amazing. Um, when you look at the wheel, wheel to body relation, it's 660 wheels here on that. So it's one generation bigger. So it has amazing stands. The car looks like a show car on the street. And then of course, I love that reduced form language. I think that's the biggest achievement. It's the latest of our Central Purity. We treat it almost like an operating system. Central Purity 1.0, 1.5 and so on. So this is 2.5. The the new clean look which is even sexier than before and so that's about the exterior and then of course if you look at the interior maybe that achievement is even bigger because we managed to do a level of quality and luxury that you are used to let's say probably two levels up and so again that mercedes is the luxury car in that segment even though it's young and sporty and all that and then last not least, we have to mention MBUX, our new operating system there, which is, I think, the best in the industry, the latest and greatest. Also, this is hot and cool. It's very emotional when you look at the picture, so it's not like this 2D vector graphic, what you're used to with smartphones. It's like three-dimensional shapes, very colorful, very exciting, but then on the same time, very reduced, very intuitive, and the menu structure allows you to do 80% of all use cases on the first two layers. So you see it's a composition of everything thing pretty much. All right, apparently that was an easy question, so I've got to go with something a, a little bit more challenging. So, I'm standing on the street and I see one of these drive past. What is it you want me to think or feel about that experience? Wow. That's about it. Wow, that's the most beautiful stunning car I've ever seen. Well, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending time with us. It's been Thank a pleasure you. to meet you. Pleasure, yeah. I'm a big fan, so I can't wait to drive it. Thank you so much. Cheers. We have been joined by Andreas Rayberger, who is responsible for drivetrain development of one of the new engines. And I have to tell you, the A-Class has three, not just one, but three brand new engines. What was the thinking there, Andreas? Ah, it's a good thinking because we have a lot of innovative uh, technical highlights in the engine. We reduce the fuel consumption of all those engines. We make more to make it a little bit sporty, so the customer has also fun, not only to reduce fuel consumption, to find both waves. This was important for those development. 
Now, I know you were responsible for just one, so I'm imagining you're a little bit biased in terms of which one you think is the best. But I would really love it if you could talk us through exactly what you've done with this engine and why you've done it. Is that okay? Yeah, of course, we can do this. <laughs> okay, let's go to him. So, this is my engine. Um, it's a 1.4 liter or exactly 1.33 liter engine um, with a lot of friction measurements on the engine where we can reduce the friction losses of the moving parts in the engine. We have here, you can see a cylinder deactivation system for the second and third cylinder, which brings us a big benefit in CO2 emission. We have also a special cylinder liner, bore spray coating cylinder liner system here, which brings also a big effect to reduce the fuel economy. We also have a new shape of cylinder head. It's a delta cylinder head where we can put the components very close to this engine. We will have a benefit in the pedestrian protection or in the frontal crash of the engine because of this compact architecture. We also, you can see it here, if you go with the camera a little bit to the turbocharger, that it is very close to the cylinder head. So we have very short uh, response time of a turbocharger so that you have a direct feeling on the, the car what you want to do. So how many Newton meters does this bad boy present? Yeah, we have 250 Newton meters and 120 kilowatt or 163 horsepowers. That's very nice. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up. Obviously, emissions is key. When you designed this powertrain, was it with in mind how to make the emissions cleaner, better? How does that integrate into the exhaust feature of the car? Okay, emissions is also a very important thing. We use, for example, a particulate filter for all of this engine is a standard thing. We, of course, look on the combustion process for itself to minimize the emissions. Um, it helps also here with this cylinder head. It has a very good cooling concept where we have a lot of freedom to optimize the combustion process and to minimize all those uh, emissions. This, is what, this was very, very good here in this engine. Okay, so this is your baby. This is the one and a half liter. Now is your opportunity on Auto Gefühl to tell us why your, your friend who designed the two liter engine is wrong. Why this is the engine we should be buying. So tell us, what is, what is really the reason we must buy this engine? This engine is of course the best engine regarding this fuel economy. It has the minimized fuel economy for a gasoline engine. It makes fun to drive also this is the engine for customers who don't want to have to the highest power, but who want to have an engine who is cheap, who can come with a minimum of CO2. Okay, I think I heard that right. If you're buying this car for your mother, this is the engine you need. If you're buying it for you, maybe the two liter. Now, a lot of our viewers are going to be concerned about diesel for obvious reasons. Now, I understand you put a new filter into the diesel engines in order to make them cleaner. Is that correct? That's something I, I cannot, I'm not sure because I'm not the diesel engineer, but yes, it would be. And the, the new OM608 1.5 liter diesel engine is, of course, also optimized regarding the, the emissions as well as on, on the CO2 side. That was the main target, of course. Thank you. Now, one more thing to trouble you with, gearboxes. As I understand it, we have two gearboxes, one of which is brand new and the other of which is optimized, so it's refreshed. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, more or less both uh, transmissions are refreshed. For the bigger engines, we have the 70 GT, uh, which you know is from the predecessor engine, which is optimized, and here we have the a smaller one um, which is also based on a predecessor which is optimized regarding fuel consumption and, and better shift quality so pressure time now your car your choice which engine which gearbox of course you have to use the a200 with the 7g dct that's a perfect choice well there you go not that he's biased at all that's a completely unbiased perspective really 
I'm very, very excited to try out your work on the track. And thank you so much for taking the time with us to explain to us all of your hard work. And I think we all very much look forward to trying it out. So that about does it from us from Amsterdam. I guess you could describe the A-Class as being something of a Marmite car. People either love it or hate it. But what I like about it is that they really do take the attitude, go big or go home. This is not an entry-level car. I know that Mercedes say it is, but let's be realistic. When you finally have the opportunity to look at the pricing, you will not find it to be competitive with other brands' entry-level cars. But then again, you will not find this degree of technology and finish on those cars either. So, you have to take it for what it is. And for my two cents, I really like that this is a brand pushing forwards. I would much rather that they said, we will not compromise on our standards. We want to innovate, we want to bring new ideas forwards, and we only want to bring the best for our customers. Now, obviously the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and we'll have to wait until we can give the car a test drive before we can really find out just what it delivers. But in terms of styling and promise, I'm really encouraged to see what Mercedes have done with this car. I think it's much more dynamic than its predecessor, and it forms a natural part of the evolution from its first iteration right through until now. It looks good on the road, it looks good on the interior, and I'm very excited to see if the drive delivers up to the promise. But until then, if you have any questions you'd like us to answer, if you have any comments, please put them below. Until then, this has been Brian for Alto Gafool. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope we'll see you again soon.